Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Alessandro. I didn't travel very, far, very long <laughs> to be here. Uh, and I'm really happy that Alessandro keeps on involved me in, in the course. Um, as I was like saying, it was a joke, but we don't do that much of microscopy. In the end, we use rather standard techniques. And so you won't see anything really uh, extremely state-of-the-art technology, but instead what I start to do, I did it last year and I thought it was appreciated, is to tell you how uh, different type of uh, microscopy approaches are used, have been used in the past to unravel uh, immune system related processes. Okay. So is, is any, or, I mean, are there many immunologists here in the audience or some? Okay, because I'm going to go quite basic on the immunological principles. So for those that are into that, forgive me if I'm saying something very obvious, but I think it's easier than to follow uh, the talk. So basically, uh, as you all know, the immune system is really complex. The system is made up of many different cells that travel a lot in the body. So they don't stay in an organ for all their life. On the contrary, they move from tissues to lymphoid organs. And within lymphoid organs, they move again. And the lymph nodes, that is the, 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 the district that has been studied the most, is a complex 3D environment with subdomains and areas. And things occur in defined subdomains. But up to uh, 2002, all we knew about immunology was coming from either uh, immunohistochemistry on fixed sections or on, uh, from experiments where cells, different types, different type of immune cells like B cells and T lymphocytes and immune cells were placed together in a dish to see uh, what was going on. In 2002, Two photon microscopy has been introduced and you begin to be used in immunology. And these allowed the real time imaging of uh, immune cell interactions in vivo in the lymph node. And uh, this is, was based, uh, uh, it is based on the possibility to transfer labeled cells into animals in order to track them. This is the advantage. I mean, this is the reason why two photon microscopy have been used mostly in immune studies because you can take the lymphocytes, label them with a dye, and then put them back, inject them back in the blood, and you find them in the lymph node. And uh, and then with years, more and more reporter uh, strains have been developed so that the the animal already express a fluorescent marker in a given immune subset or even uh, fluorescence associated to particular context so that just upon stimulus you will see your cell uh, firing and, 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 getting, uh, and getting colored. And, uh, and so again, what I will tell you is a little bit about what two photon microscopy has uh, brought to us in terms of, of new knowledge. And then I will tell you a little bit on the other uh, level at which immune system is studied, again using microscopy, that means looking at cells interacting with each other and trying to understand the molecular events that are taking place within what is called immunological synapse. Uh, two photon microscopy is a technique that allows to uh, image deep in tissues with very low toxicity. That's the principle of it. And this is uh, how, what rendered possible to uh, expose a lymph node and then, and then uh, uh, analyze what's going within the lymph node capsule. Uh, so intravital multiphoto microscopy somehow has revealed the choreography of, of the immune uh, reaction of immune responses to antigens. And, quest and different sort of questions have been asked and answered in part on the uh, dynamics of the different interactions among immune cells, what happens during infection, and for instance, how a cancer cell is rejected by a cytotoxic T lymphocytes, or what happens during rejection of, of a transplant. And I'm gonna give you some of these examples showing a couple of movies and, and the models that then people have uh, derived from this type of analysis. Uh, and this is a cartoon more or less summarizing the same type of concept. So the germinal center formation have been recorded. 
the process of antigen capture, B cell chemotaxis, T B cells interaction, T D C interactions, and we're going to a little bit more on that, proliferation of T cells, and the final step when T cells have been primed and exit the lymph node to go and, 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 and perform their job in uh, periphery. So very basic reminder of how an immune response is uh, started. So uh, virally infected cells or dying tumor cells are taken up by antigen presenting cells that process antigens derived from these two sources, um, loaded on MHC plus one and two molecules and give the signal to CD4 and CD8 cells that as a consequence of these interaction begin to proliferate as I said before. And then those guys go back to the periphery and to perform their job that is either killing directly the infected cell or CD4 T cells, give help to B cells to make antibodies or be, give help to cytotoxic T cells. So early in 2002, uh, the first uh, paper came out showing T linked T cells moving in a lymph node. There was a uh, great excitement about it. It was very naive and simple setup compared to what people do now, but it was still uh, giving some kind of information. So what you will see here is uh, green T cells that have been transferred into an animal that has no antigen or antigen at different time points. And so, uh, and those uh, type of analysis show that in the very beginning, T cells move around very quickly, but then begin uh, the input loop. Uh, but then uh, they uh, start stopping after a day, so something is happening there, and then they rescue their movement later on until they move very fast. And then people went on. I mean, there have been many studies in the next 10 years refining more and more these sort of concepts, trying to look at the other counter side. And here we are not seeing antigen presenting cells, we are only seeing T cells. This is an example, for instance, a few years later, uh, Uli von Ander, who was one, is the scientist who contributed the most to this type of studies. Uh, so what you will see here is antigen presenting cells in red. And then you have two types of T cells, the specific, those that are specific for the antigen, and then control T cells that don't recognize anything on this disease. And, uh, uh, but you will see the same concept that were derived from the earlier movies we just confirmed here, were basically confirmed here. So if you look at this reaction early on, everybody is moving, both specific and non-specific T cells move around. <coughs> but if you then look at uh, what's going on a few hours later, what you clearly see is that the blue cells that are the specific one for the antigen are rested on antigen presenting cells, whereas the other ones keep on uh, moving around. You can, you can uh, obviously extract many parameters from those movies, such as the duration of the contact, the number of the contact as a function of the antigen density, and so on. But basically then people came, out with this, uh, came up with this model. Naive T cells, so cells that haven't seen any antigen before, comes in and begin to uh, patrol the environment of the lymph node. And once they have uh, accumulated sufficient signals, they stop on the antigen presenting cell and, begun, and, and, and begin to, to proliferate. But actually, I'm saying that, but people really didn't know how proliferation uh, occurs. The first studies were mostly focused on understanding the first phases of encounter and stopping on the antigen presenting cells. Now, if we move of, again, 10 years, because the movies I'm going to show you now are from earlier this year, from 2018, uh, in here, what the, the, the group wanted to address is what happens to a T cell uh, once the contact is finished, or, or, or in other words, when does the T cell begin to proliferate? Does it do it really when it's still sitting on the DC or, or later? And well, first, I don't know why I couldn't change the icon. I mean, it's like this. It's bad, but then it works. So you will see here first a T cell dividing. So in here, people were able to really catch the event of division. And um, in here, 
the question was, does the T-cell divide when it's sitting on a DC or later? And it seemed from here that the T-cell divides when it's not engaged with a DC anymore. And here, uh, there was the possibility to, to, thanks to these reporter strains and development of dyes, to address the question a little bit more in detail, which means differentiating undivided T-cells from divided T-cells, because they have fluorescence which is slightly different and can be discriminated. And what this type of movies showed is that indeed undivided T-cells stays in, are in touch with the antigen-presenting cells, whereas once they are divided, they begin to, I mean, you see them, you see them uh, traveling by, by their own. And uh, a further refinement of this type of, of uh, approach is that you can also, it's not, unfortunately you don't see it here, but in here the reporter that was used is uh, a reporter for interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is produced by the T cell when it gets activated. Uh, so the, these mice have a um, fluorescence associated to the interferon gene. So green, uh, sorry, orange uh, T cells have uh, switched on interferon, whereas the um, red T cells uh, have not. And again, what uh, was found here is that the orange cells that have activated interferon are already moving around, whereas the pre-activation cells are sitting on the DC. And, and this allowed to uh, come up with this model. So once an IT cells enter the lymph node, there's this first phase of early contacts where all the signals for activation are accumulated. But then for division to occur, the T cell must disengage from the antigen presenting cell, divide, and then travel in, uh, in periphery. Um, so this is priming, the very initial phases of T cell priming. But uh, once a T cell is primed, especially a cytotoxic T cell, it has to find its target and kill its target. So this is a second question that has been addressed thanks to this type of, of uh, approaches. So trying to look at a killer T cell that kills either a virally infected cell or a tumor cell, because there were many open questions in this respect. So where does it exactly occur? How many contacts are needed to eliminate uh, a viral infected or tumor <coughs> cell? Are CTAs, um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, really killing tumor cells directly, or do they rather recruit other bystander mechanisms? So two photon microscopy allowed to, to address some of these questions. And I'm going to show you two examples, one for tumor cells and one for virally infected cells. Uh, this is just a, a model, just to show that the model works. So you have a system whereby you have a yellow tumor in mice, and then you inject uh, OT1 um, T lymphocytes that are specific for that tumor, and the tumor is indeed eliminated. So it's the right uh, situation to start and try recording what's going on. But in, in addition, what people did here is to uh, introduce in the cancer cell a reporter for apoptosis. And it's a very simple system uh, based on FRET, whereby when caspase is activated, FRET is induced. So a dying cancer cell will uh, switch on, I mean, will switch fluorescence. And this is a tool to really uh, monitor and record dying uh, cells in tissue. And the movie is not great, I must say, but still. Then they quantified so much that you think it's really going the way they say. So if you're, no. Uh, you should be able to see some uh, CTLs, red cells, in contact with tumor cells becoming, uh, becoming green. Okay. And, and again, the type of information you can get from this type of analysis is, for instance, how many uh, CTL are in contact and how this is reflected into the apoptotic index, uh, how many contacts you need for a cell to die. And so just to make it short, it was, what was uh, learned from this study is that it 
it's important to have um, six, uh, you need six hours to, to induce apoptosis and the major driving question that the people ask at the beginning is that indeed most of tumor elimination is operated directly via, di I mean, via direct killing and not through engagement of, of uh, bystander mechanism. It's really the CDL that kills in vivo as well. Because again, this is a typical example where there exists Thousands of studies showing killing of cancer cells in a dish, but very few that have been able to really record and, and, and monitor this event in vivo. Uh, this is instead viral immunity. Um, so in here, again, just make sure that the model works. So there is a virus that carries uh, red fluorescence. So these are infected cells in the subcapsular sinus. Uh, and collagen, just to see where the uh, infected cells are, are really near the capsule. They're not immune cells, they're rather fibroblast-like cells, and density of these cells correlates well with density measured by, by other tools like enzymatic assays. And so what people did next is to transfer into these same animals infected with, uh, where infected cells are red, transfer viral specific T cells and then record over time the elimination of, of, of those cells. So there again, you'll see it here over time, you have an infected cell surrounded by cytotoxic T cells specific for viral antigens and over time that cell is completely, is completely gone. And uh, well, this is the movie, but doesn't really add much. Perhaps we can just show there are many examples, but you see it in live on different angles. The, the, the poor cell there is, is, is totally shocked. And uh, once more, you can then extract number of target per number of CDLs, the time that it's needed before you achieve elimination. And, uh, and the message here, the main message here, is that accumulation of multiple contacts is required for killing of a viral infected cell. So you don't, you don't need just one contact, but you need to accumulate, again, several hits uh, in order to, to, to really eliminate the cell. And uh, an example of what I was mentioning when you can add reporter, for instance, in here, the people wanted to go a little bit further to document the killing event. And so in this case, the virus was uh, engineered to express a calcium sensor. <coughs> and so this allowed to uh, really monitor calcium fluxes that correspond to really to hits of uh, cytotoxic uh, granules. So how many spikes you need before you die and how many spikes <coughs> lead to death and, 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 and so on. And these are the calcium fluxes, but I'm going to skip that. Um, I'm going to make you two more examples. This is more recent, and uh, uh, I'm just going to show you the model that uh, arised from this type of studies. I'm not going to show you the, the data um, one by one. But what is important to a, la a further layer to add to what I said so far. So it's not as simple as, 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 as I mentioned in the beginning. Antigen-presenting cells exist in different uh, flavors, so there are different subsets with specialized functions. And T cells are different. We have CD8 and CD4, and they need to cooperate and get an, a, a signal and interact um, with each other. And it wasn't really known how this, how this occurs during, uh, during an infection. So who is acti activated first? what type of dendritic cells gives the first signal and how do the two interact with each other. And this study was really important because by means of many reporter and, uh, and the tracking system, people were able to define that the first infected migratory disease that from periphery comes into the lymph node first interacts with CD4 T cells in the uh, T cell area of the lymph node and later on, during uh, in late infections, instead, these cells, the antigen-presenting cells, transfer the antigen to the 
second type of DC, which is called the FCR1 DC, and these type of DC of antigen presenting cells provide a platform for co-activation of CD4 and CD8, <coughs> promoting T cell health and permitting a robust activation of the, all uh, antiviral responses. And it was, this was shown really clearly by functional studies, whereby if you interrupt this platform, there is no good, I mean, the antiviral immunity is much less um, efficient. And staying on antiviral immunity by but moving on B cells, again, I'm just going to show you a cartoon, uh, but it's just to, I mean, to think in how really watching what was going on gave, uh, it is giving a lot of hints on, on, on what is really uh, happening. This is a different example. The question asked was why there are some viruses that upon infection don't give rise to neutralizing antibodies immediately? Why there's a lag phase? And so why this response is not immediately started? And what people uh, uh, found out here is that once uh, uh, a virus enters, there's a first contact with, with B cells. So there is an initial response. But then type 1 interferon produced by the viral infection recruits inflammatory monocytes that arrive massively into the lymph node and kill, literally kill B cells. So this is uh, a mechanism of immune evasion that was not known before. It's a recent paper from like, a year ago. And it that was discovered really by watching at the different uh, interactions in the, in the lymph node. So just to sum up, I just made some examples, but uh, uh, in vivo imaging, uh, of immune cells have been used for other, uh, in other instances as well to look and study thymus, uh, development of the thymus, brain infections, skin transplants, small uh, bowel uh, diseases, what happens in the bone marrow, and again, I mean, I showed you mostly what happens in, uh, in lymph node. So now, moving from, I mean, as you can imagine here, we can look at uh, cells interacting to each other, we can get some functional information, thanks <coughs> to reporters. What is more difficult to achieve is to, there, there are improvements, but still it's hard to get information at the molecular level in vivo. So most of what we know about immune uh, reactions at the molecular level comes instead from uh, in vitro studies where two types of immune cells are put together on a slide and or under the microscope or under the video microscope and analyzed. And again, I'm going to do a short historical perspective of, of how things went. We are always talking about the same situation that I presented in the beginning. So the initial priming of T cell, what people discovered in 2003 is that when these two cells interact, there is, a, there is a, no reorganization of molecules of the, uh, synaptic, uh, in the synaptic region, whereby signaling molecules are clustered in the middle, whereas uh, accessory and adhesion molecules are pushed um, in the periphery. And this is what was called at the time the bull eye structure. So you have a central structure where signaling takes place and then uh, adhesion molecules that are pushed away to favor signaling. But this model was quickly then uh, um, revisited when technology evolved and what people, uh, I mean, imaging the immune synapse when you have two true cells is really hard because you need to find, I mean, now there are improvements, you can squeeze the cells, you can do many things, but at the time, the, the getting into details with the two cells interacting was hard, so people developed lipid, uh, planar lipid layers where you can insert molecules that would mimic the antigen presenting cell. So you just reconstitute peptide MHC complexes and co stimulation. And so then you place your T cell and you, you can record directly from here and really monitor tiny events with a much higher resolution than you could <coughs> do if you have the two cells together. 
Uh, and so, just to say that these models evolved quickly, so people rapidly found out that instead this central clustering of signaling molecules is rather an event that happens when signal is switched off and not on. So before signaling occurs within nanoclusters, and nowadays, uh, we are learning more and more using the uh, palm. We can dissect exactly how the single signaling molecules are distributed within these nanoclusters in T cells. So these studies, uh, obviously, there, is, there are people that are studying this since years and are, and, and then are going deeper and deeper into this, but it has to be uh, kept in mind that this has, an import, uh, has a lot of important implications for T cell fitness. You probably know that uh, engineered T cells like CAR T cells are now one of the frontier in immunotherapy and knowing exactly what's going on during signaling gives uh, hints to modify T cells in order to render the signaling uh, more persistent, more efficient, and to avoid, for instance, suppression. So these basic studies on how exactly signaling takes uh, place, occurs in T cells, are now rapidly being translated into uh, more efficient um, engineered T cells for, for therapy. <coughs> okay, now I'm gonna switch to my story. <laughs> And this story started many years ago when I was in Paris for a postdoc, and it was exactly the time when people started to look at immune cells interacting to each other, and as you have heard, people were <coughs> focusing mostly on the T cell, because the T cell is the cell that then kills the target, so it's like, it was more interesting, and it is easier to manipulate, but instead I was in a dendritic cell lab, and so we decided to look at what, what do we see in this, in this uh, <laughs> Interaction. I mean, what, what is important on their side? And, and, and as you see from this movie, they do a lot. They really search for the T cell and establish a tight hug, which makes you think that all these membranes can optimize the transmission of the signal and facilitate priming. So uh, we, we already, we know as well that these interaction permits to transfer three types of signals, NHC peptide to the TCR, Co-stimulatory molecule to co-stimulatory molecules on T cells, and also secretion of inflammatory cytokines that are important for the fitness of, of the T cells. And, uh, and indeed, in um, in our lab, we've been interested in uh, trying to understand remodeling of uh, intracellular vesicles in dendritic cells during synapse formation of T cells. And uh, uh, for instance, what we discovered some years ago is that also disease, it was very well described for T cells, but we uh, realized that also dendritic cells polarize when they interact with the T cells. This is quantified using a centrin uh, GFP uh, reporter dendritic cells, so that um, visualization of the microtubule organizing center is neater and, and sharper, so we could see that this event takes place, is peptide uh, dependent, depends on CDC42, which, which is, one, that is one of the classical regulator of, of polarity, and it is important for T cell priming, uh, meaning that this polarization event leads to a better and more efficient activation of T cells. Uh, one thing that, that we, we've noticed when, when looking at these slides, we, we quantified and looked at many of them, as you can imagine, uh, we also began to, to be interested in, in the soluble signals that needs to be transmitted during priming, and in particular at one cytokine, that is IL-12, that is essential for T cell priming, and we saw that it was really uh, clustered and enriched around the microtubule organizing center. And so we uh, decided to study how IL-12 is transported mm -hmm. from the ER to the synaptic area. I'm going to be really quick on that. We took inspiration from studies by other people that dissected secretory pathways in macrophages. And this is done, I mean, it can be done in many ways. The way that we have decided to follow is to track vesicles by defining the snares that would decorate those vesicles, because snares 
are associated to specific trafficking steps. So by mapping the snares and mapping to which type of snare your cargo is associated, you can get insight into the trafficking pathway that your cargo uh, is, um, is following to exit, from the, to, to be secreted. So um, we labeled IL-12, that was our, our, our objective, and we co-labeled, I, I mean, we, we co-labeled IL-12 with several different snares. I'm gonna make it really short now. We found that IL-12 is mostly associated to BAM-7, that is a snare associated specifically to late endosomes. Uh, we recorded how BAM-7 gets clustered at the synapse together with IL-12, and um, I mean, we recorded in live that IL-12, it's indeed uh, being recruited at the synaptic, um, in the synaptic cleft, and that then by using was, uh, one seven knockout animals, we get a reduction in the secretion of IL-12 at the synapse and priming when cells don't have this near for trafficking is uh, heavily uh, reduced. So the model that we could uh, then uh, the, the design is the following, so IL-12 is produced in the ER and then travels through vesicles that are of late lysosomal origin and gets recruited and secreted at the synapse. And this was a, a contribution in the sense that before it was not known that IL-12 goes this way and especially is quite unusual for a cytokine that is a constitutively secreted cytokine to follow a pathway that is normally used by um, pre-stored granules, like, like cytotoxic granules. And I'm gonna end up with a last example of how we have been using microscopy to, to address uh, immune uh, cell function, or in this case, bad functioning of immune cells. Because we are studying since um, some time um, an autoimmune disease that is uh, caused by uh, a deficiency in an actin regulatory protein. It's called Wiscologic syndrome. And uh, in this syndrome, uh, there is uh, basically an immunodeficiency, but there's also a high frequency of autoimmune phenomena. So uh, it is known for many others, uh, autoimmune diseases, especially systemic uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus, that there is an important component of type 1 interferon underlying the disease. And what people discovered is that endogenous, sorry, I'm making confusion here. Oh, I think there is one piece missing. Well, that what happens in these diseases is that endogenous stimuli that should be uh, ignored by the cell are trafficked into endosomes and leads to activation to toll like receptor and excessive type 1 interferon. And this type 1 interferon that is normally dedicated to eliminate viruses is constantly produced because of, rec of, because of erroneous recognition of endogenous stimuli and then cause an amplification loop of T cells and B cells and leads to uh, autoimmunity. So basically what we realize is that in this syndrome that we were interested in, there was a similar uh, phenotype, meaning that knockout cells, cells knockout for WASP, would respond by producing much larger amount of interferon when stimulated with endogenous agonists. When I say endogenous agonists, I mean immune complexes, DNA with uh, out anti, anti double strand DNA antibodies. And we were really keen in understanding why, especially because, as I mentioned, this is an actin regulatory protein. And this phenomenon is uh, strictly linked to <coughs> trafficking within the endocytic pathway. So we wanted to know why, why so? Why when I give this to wasp knockout cells, they produce a lot of interferon when normal cells don't produce almost anything. And so the, we decided to, 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 to address it by, by studying the cell biology of the endocytic pathway in knockout cells. And I will make it really, really short. What we realized with Julia found and quantified in many <laughs> slides is that indeed endosomes in knockout cells are much larger than in wild type counterpart. They look like uh, clusters of many endosomes collapsing together. 
and they are more distant. They are kept in the periphery when compared. The distance from the nucleus is higher when compared to, to wild type cells. Uh, she tried to, re to record the uh, formation of endocytic vesicles in live by giving a probe that binds to lectin lectins on the surface that is then rapidly uh, internalized. And as you see, in a wild type cells, a few minutes after loading, you do see many vesicles forming and traveling more or less in an organized way towards the cell center. Whereas the phenotype of knockout cells is really dramatically different, and you get this huge, uh, blood, huge, huge spots of vesicles that remains in the periphery, and the impression it gives, they can't really fission. And um, And so, uh, given this aberrant uh, endocytic pathway, we wanted to track our ligand when it comes in. So I told you what triggers interferon is immune complexes. So we tracked what happens to immune complexes in wild type or knockout cells. And over time, by co-labeling at the same time early endosomes here, in the next slide we'll have late endosomes uh, and lysosomes. And what we found is that in wild type cells, we give the cargo and it rapidly disappears from early endosomes, whereas in knockout it tends to stay much longer and the size of these immune complexes is, is larger. If we look at 40 minutes, there is nothing left in the, um, no, sorry, not nothing left, no co-localization, early endosomes immune complexes in wild type cells. In knockout, we still do see big patches that have not been able to, to traffic. And if we then now go to late time points and look at lysosomes, we do confirm our hypothesis, meaning that in wild type cells, most of the immune complexes are associated to uh, lysosomes, and there are very few that is left. It's already already chewed, already destroyed. Whereas in knockout cells, we see big clusters that haven't been able to totally fuse with lysosomes and persist. And this was just another way to to show the same thing. And uh, there are many other data, but basically the, the model that we uh, have uh, then conceived based on this data is that in a Wild type cells, there, there exist, I mean, there always exist immune complexes circulating in the body. So double strand DNA with uh, anti double strand DNA, but this is normally tolerated by the cell. So what we think happens is that once they are internalized, they are rapidly trafficked to late endosomes and lysosomes and degraded. So the concentration never reaches a le the threshold level to induce interference. Instead, what we think happens in most efficient cells is that they get stuck and they stall in an aberrant, uh, immature, poorly defined, early, late endosomal vesicle. They accumulate and in, the, in this way they don't get degraded and they keep on signaling. I mean, they reach the threshold and they signal to produce interferon. And this is probably one of the way we can explain autoimmune uh, phenomena in, uh, in this disease. And I'm done with that. I want to thank some of the people, because now the light is turning a lot, so many people are not here anymore. But Julia, as my initially, but then Julia did most of the things I showed you in the last part. And, uh, well, and then some of the collaborators. And thank you. And I'm happy to take questions if you have.